Hey, what's up everybody? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I'm gonna to be reviewing the Arendelle 1961 tower speaker. Now I've already reviewed the 1961 bookshelf speaker. I'll put it in the cart up here, but today we're gonna to talk about the tower speaker. And I gotta say right up front that I'd not heard of Arendelle other than maybe last year, I think Audioholics, James Larson from Audioholics had reviewed one of their speakers and I thought, that looks pretty good, but as it turns out, man, they make some really good stuff. So one of their dealers, um, actually from overseas, and I, I'm sorry, Dan, I, I forgot where you're from, but he reached out and said, would you be interested in testing them? And so he facilitated it and got me hooked up with the folks at Arendel, and they sent out this pair for me to review. Obviously, I wasn't paid for my review. I wasn't paid for anything like that. Uh, and they haven't seen this review yet. They won't see it until it's published for everybody else to see. But I want to put that up front so you know where the speakers came from. And yes, they're going back. I'm actually going to ship them up this afternoon. So get that out of the way first. Um, let's see here. The Arendelle is, what can I say about it that stands out the most? Oh, yeah. Very simple. It's a small speaker. For tower speakers, at least. I mean, it's it's not tall at all. Check this out. Look. Look at this, look at this. Well, first of all, ignore the dork in the middle, but I, I guess I'm trying to look hardcore. I don't know, I don't know why I made that pose, but ignore that. Look at the fact that they barely, doesn't even come up to waist height. Now I'm average height, I think I'm like 5'11", maybe 6'5", when I'm online trying to act tough, but I, they're about average height. They're really small. You can see that I've got the outriggers on the bottom of the one on the right, and on the bottom on the one on the left, I don't have the outriggers, and I just wanted to kind of show you that you can set the speaker up either way. Um, you can also see on the bottom left that there is a port down here that I did have stuffed. And that's how I tested these speakers was in the sealed configuration. You can also see that there is a kickback to the speaker. It's about a five degree tilt. And that's important to understand when we talk about the data. I'm gonna mention this at least once more, if not a, a few more times, because I don't want things to be taken out of context you need to understand that when we talk about the data. This is a two and a half way design, features a 28 millimeter dome tweeter, I believe, and a, and a nice waveguide. It features four five and a half inch mid range mid woofer drivers. They cost $16.99 US dollars per pair, and I believe that that's shipped, but don't quote me on that. And the cool thing is, you also have a 60 day buy and try time period. So if you order them and you just find that you don't like them, you can ship them back. When I tested them, I do like I always do. I run them through multi-tone stimulus for hours and hours. Um, sometimes I do it for days. Sometimes I do it for a day, but you're talking plenty of break-in time. And then I go and listen to them and then I go and test them. So these speakers were fully broken in. If you're really into that sort of thing, which I'm not necessarily then yes, they're fully broken in. As far as sound goes, I think it's a fantastic speaker, truly. Uh, I really love the nice punchy bass and the silk configuration. When I put it in the Porta configuration, it just lit up too many room modes. So personally speaking, I like the silk configuration more and I'm happy to do that and just use a subwoofer because a speaker like this isn't gonna plumb the depths of 20 Hertz or 30 Hertz. So you're still gonna want a subwoofer if you want low bass. and if you're doing that, then I always recommend just to go ahead and run a sealed enclosure. The reasons for that are many. That might be a topic for a later video, but generally speaking, it's a little bit easier to integrate a subwoofer to a sealed speaker system. That's a generic way of saying that's what I like to do. But as I said, we'll talk about that later if you guys really want to get into that. Now, here's a couple more close-up photos so you can kind of see what I'm talking about with the mid ranges and the tweeter. And that, that's a big old dome tweeter, by the way. It's, it's 25 millimeters is about an inch. And most dome tweeters are three quarter to one inch. When you see a 28 dome tweeter or 28 millimeter dome tweeter, for some reason, it just seems much larger than even a one inch dome tweeter. And they're only three millimeters apart. It's not, it's nothing really. But for some reason, they just look larger. And the flip side of that is I would actually expect then that you would have more problems in the high frequency because you've got a larger dome tweeter. But this dome tweeter is really well designed. Any breakup modes that it seems to have are either flushed out by the waveguide or they're designed well enough where the breakup modes are pushed high in the higher frequencies and outside of the audible range. 
Now, remember I mentioned that the speaker has a natural tilt to it by about five degrees, and that's important to understand because when you're sitting in a chair, a, a normal seating height, you're, I would say, at least, at least half a foot, if not a foot above the tweeter line. I mean, at least. Because remember, the tweeter is the second, second driver down. And when you do that, you're like, well, this ain't, this ain't right. Like, you don't want your tweeter below you. Okay, there's some caveats. But generally speaking, you don't want your tweeter below you. But because the speaker is tilted back, it actually points the tweeter right at your ear in, in most seated positions. Even my upstairs room and my downstairs room, it, it, no issues with aligning the tweeter in that regard. And I think that this really goes into the design aspect. It's not an oversight or anything like that. Allow me to go off topic a second. The design of this speaker being so compact, I think that that's exactly what they wanted to do. They said, hey guys, we're going to have to put this speaker, we're going to have to make it small, right? This is, this is, the, this is the idea we're going with. We want a small speaker so it can fit smaller rooms or you know a normal room in places where large rooms aren't the norm, right? So if you have an apartment or maybe you live in a country where space is a super, super premium and you don't have a, a large living space to listen to speakers, you make a, a more compact speaker. But in doing so, you know, if it's not tall, you're going to put the listening axis below you. So they lean it back, puts the listening axis right at your ear. Good to go. But the reason it matters in the measurements is because when I measured, the speaker is leaning back. The measurement is pointed right at the tweeter. So you're going to get a fall off in the high frequencies in the measurement. It's not really a big deal if you understand that going into it, because then you can just say, hey, look at the vertical and figure you're going to be about five degrees above the tweeter line to get the most nominal flat measurement. But as I said, in the seated position, you're angled. It's all good. So you're going to be more flat on axis in the seated position than what these measurements are going to show you. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, just ask me in the comments below and I'll try to clarify as best I can. Now, I've already told you that I like the speaker. I think it sounds great. The only thing that I don't like about the speaker is that the radiation pattern isn't as wide. And if you've watched my channel enough, you've watched my reviews enough, you understand exactly what I mean. And it's that I prefer a speaker with a reasonably wide radiation pattern. I would say, you know, above plus or minus 50 degrees or so. And anything below that, you know, it's doesn't really illuminate the room enough for me. I like room interaction. That's how you get that, that apparent source width. It sounds like there's images further out in the sound field than maybe there really is. And that's purely preference, guys. It's just 100% preference. So let's go ahead and flip into the data and I'll try to run through this as quickly as I can and give you a good idea of what the performance of the speaker is objectively, uh, correlate with what I heard, and then we'll dip out. The first thing I want to note is the impedance. No issue for a amplifier to drive the speaker, but an AVR is probably going to have problems with it. And I say that because you do dip below the 4 ohm mark through here. And I don't think most AVRs are capable of 4 ohm. Maybe they are. Check with the manufacturer. But generally speaking, you're probably going to want a amplifier for this speaker. Now let's look at the CEA 2034 data. And it actually looks pretty good. Yes, there are little variations of what appears to be some resonances here throughout, especially right through here and right around here. And then the other thing, as I said, there's a fall off right through here. You can see what I mean right here. So the speaker on axis in the measurement is not flat. And again, that's because the speaker is tilted back about five degrees. So if I were to have taken the measurement with the reference axis above about five degrees, then it would be more flat in the on axis response. The early reflections, directivity index, and the sound power actually both look pretty darn good. The dip right here is most certainly attributed to the vertical radiation. And then there is an on-axis dip, and that's probably due to the symmetry of the waveguide, but I don't think that's going to be a big issue. Whether or not you can hear that, I will leave that up to you. You might want to check out the bookshelf review because I talked about that a little bit more and provided a sound demo as well. The listening window tracks the on-axis quite well, so uh, no issues there. Average sensitivity is about 86.5 dB, which is good enough for most people. Personally speaking, I like a speaker with a little bit more sensitivity, but that's just a personal thing. If you're living in a smaller room, you really don't need a ton of sensitivity either. The roll off rate, 12 dB per octave or so. Uh, F3 at about 62 Hertz, F10 at about 43 Hertz. 
which means that this really isn't going to get very low. You are going to want a subwoofer. This is the estimated in-room response, again, with a speaker that is tilted back. So it's even more severe than normal. But you can see that it reasonably follows pretty well. There are some little dips through here of about 1 to 2 dB. And then this one stands out a little bit more. So depending on what you prefer or what you're used to listening to or the things that you tend to notice more, you may find those missing in detail or missing in forwardness, maybe missing a little bit in vocals. It, it really just depends on how you characterize the sound. Personally speaking, with these being as minor as they are in level and the fact that they're dips rather than peaks, I'm okay with that. The horizontal response looks really quite good. Now, again, we're talking about seeing issues going on through here, jaggedness and stuff like that, you know, maybe low level resonances or something of that effect. But if you just look at the trends, you can see that it's really quite good through here. And the only really disparity is above about eight kilohertz or so where the fall off begins to, to fall off a, a little bit higher of a rate. It could also be in connection to what I'm seeing right here. And that could be diffraction effects. I'm, I'm not necessarily sure if that's a diffraction effect from the enclosure or if that's a waveguide thing, but regardless, it doesn't look bad. This is the horizontal radiation. Remember earlier I said that it's not as wide as I personally prefer it to be, and we can see why. It starts to narrow up below the, what is that, about 1.3 kilohertz, and then we see it get narrow in frequency. Distortion and compression are where the Arendal speakers really stand out. I mean, we're talking premium components that are used in these designs that allow them to get to louder levels than the budget counterparts from other brands. And that's what really separates the Arendal speakers, in my opinion, from the speakers that are maybe half the price. Here we have the distortion at 86 dB at one meter. And then if we go up to 96 dB at one meter, we don't cross 3% distortion until we get down to 80 Hertz. You're below 1% distortion all the way down to 100 Hertz. And this is at 96 dB, this is pretty darn loud. Then if we go to the compression, again, this looks really good for such a small speaker. I really am impressed. Now I've tested speakers that are larger that have worse compression measurements than this speaker. Certainly you are paying a premium because even though this is the budget line of Arendal's products, it's still on the expensive side. They're about 1700 bucks a pair. But if you compare that to budget speakers, maybe that are half the price, this is really and truly what separates the designs. The linearity is great, but the compression and distortion are just on another level compared to other budget designs. And that's gonna be it for the data portion of this review. I have this data and more on my website, which will be linked in the description below. My overall summary is that these are fantastic speakers, and I truly do mean that. Would I run them personally if I lived in a smaller place? Yes. Now, I am a big speaker fan. I like large, imposing speakers. I like speakers that look like they would beat me up and take my lunch money and do it again the next day. Um, but having said that, I understand that not everybody has the space. I do have a dedicated listening space for larger speakers. But for those of you who don't, or for those of you who just don't like larger speakers, hey, that's fine too. I think this is easily one of the better speakers that's gonna be out there for you, especially if you like to listen at louder volume or you like a good bit of dynamic range. Other speakers just can't compare in this regard. The linearity of the speaker is great. You can EQ to your heart's content and shape the sound to be basically whatever you want it to be. So you've got that going for you as well. And overall, no problem recommending it. And since they had the 60 day buy and try, if you're thinking about getting these speakers, just go ahead and do it. Try them out in your home, see if they work for you, see if the size is something that you like. You may really be surprised because pictures don't do it justice. They're like, when I took them out of the box, actually, when I got the box, I thought, did they ship me like the monitors instead of the tower speakers? Cause they're that small, relatively speaking. It really surprised me, but I, again, I think they're fantastic speakers. No problem recommending them. Um, try them out, see what you think, and that's it. If you like what you see, be sure to hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button and notification bell if you haven't already done that. Uh, if you wanna support via Patreon, that would be awesome. Patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And that's it for me. I hope you have a great day. I will talk to y'all later. Peace.